Hi, I'm Eric Lind. I'm a deacon here at Penny, and I'll be reading from 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 7 through 11. The end of all things is near. Therefore, be alert and of sober mind, so that you may pray. Above all, love each other deeply, because love covers over a multitude of sins. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. If anyone speaks, they should do so as one who speaks the very words of God. If anyone serves, they should do so with the strength God provides. So that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and power forever and ever. Amen. This is the word of God. Well, we continue tonight looking at the church, and we will get to the image of who we are as the church that we have in this text, but I think we should start, I think we have to start with these arresting words that begin our reading tonight, words that are designed to focus our attention and to call for action. Think of these words, the end is is near. Uh, Those are words to get your attention. Uh, Those are words that you would expect to call to action anytime you hear somebody say it. Imagine the options. The end is near. The end of what? The end of the road. So you better turn around and drive in the other direction, right? Or if somebody says the end is near, the end of what? The end of the election season. So you better vote. And I know, rejoice. (laughs) No more ads, right? The end is near. The end is near. The end of what? The end of your paycheck. You better stop spending. The end is near. The end of what? The end of the buffet uh, line. You better go fill your plate before you're going to run out. The end is near. The end of what? Peter says, the end of all things. These are words designed to get and focus our attention and to call to action. But before we call to action, we should just stay on these words for a second. The end is near. The end of all things is near. The first thing we should probably do before we even move on from that is just be honest. When you hear that, is there a little bit of skepticism that rises up in your heart? Really? Didn't he write this 2,000 years ago? The end is near? Didn't he get that one wrong? I, what, what are we to say when we hear these words? The end is near right now. Well, think with me first just about that for a moment. Uh, you know, by definition, the end of all things that Peter predicts, and not just Peter, that Paul prophesies, and not just Paul, that Jesus proclaims is near. The end that is near, by definition, uh, an end uh, if it, it will only, by definition, happen once, right? Uh, the end only comes once. If it's the end of all things, you can only happen once. And just because it hasn't happened yet doesn't mean that it won't happen at all. There are a lot of different examples of this, but uh, one I could give. Uh, let me just take you back to a memorable moment, Super Bowl 51. Do you remember Super Bowl 51? Patriots, Falcons. Uh, In the previous 50 Super Bowls, no one had ever come back from anything more than a 9 or 10 point deficit. Do you remember how much the Patriots were down in Super Bowl 51? 25 points. No one had ever done it before. That means by definition, it couldn't happen, right? No, it just hadn't happened yet. Uh, It just hadn't happened yet. Uh, Just because it hasn't happened yet doesn't mean it's not going to to happen. Or imagine the person who says, I haven't died yet, so I guess that means I'm not going to. <laughs> no, it just hasn't happened yet. When, when it happens, it will happen, and that's the end. It only happens once. Uh, it hasn't happened yet, but that uh, does not mean that it won't happen, or even for that matter, couldn't happen soon. And by the way, just on that side point, uh, the end of all things for you and I could happen at any time. Uh, But the apostles announced and Jesus proclaimed that when he came, his coming, 
was the beginning of the end. Uh, It was the start of the last chapter in the great dramatic story of human history. It was not the end yet, but Jesus said his coming began the last chapter and God has already promised, has already told us what the next gigantic thing is that's going to happen in the history of the world. You have creation, you have Israel, you have Jesus, you have cross, resurrection, and the next thing that's coming, we're in the last chapter, the next big thing that's happened is the return of Christ and the end of all things. And here's what else we know. Not only just because it hasn't happened yet doesn't mean it's not going to happen at all, but we also know this. The world now is closer to its ending than it has ever been before. Every day, we're closer. This is what Paul wrote, the Apostle Paul, in Romans 13, 11. Listen to these words. The end is near. Listen to what Paul wrote. And do this, understanding the present time. The hour has already come for you to wake up from your slumber because our salvation, listen to these words, our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is nearly over. The day is almost here. Every day, that much closer. And here are Peter's words, inspired by the Holy Spirit, that come to us today. The end is near, close, drawing closer. So what? What now? Uh, If it's the end of the road, you better turn around. If it's the end of the election season, you better vote. If it's uh, the end of your paycheck, you better stop spending. If it's the end of all things, uh, then... What? Well, uh, a few things. For starters, here's the first. Look at that verse, verse 7. The end of all things is near. Therefore, this means because that is so, right? Therefore, be alert and of sober mind so that you may pray. The end of the world as we know it is near. Therefore, first, don't panic. Pray. Don't panic. Pray. Pray. Uh, you notice the first few verses. I mean, you might think it's, uh, did you, do you remember that song, uh, uh, It's the End of the World as We Know It and I Feel Fine? Did you ever hear that song? Uh, Peter, Peter is, is saying here, the end of all things is near, and yet it is not, uh, the call then is not to, to freak out and run around like a henny penny and say the sky is falling. Instead, he calls for just the opposite, doesn't he? The end of all things is near, therefore, be alert and of sober mind. Uh, be alert and of sober mind, uh, self-controlled, have a sound mind, a disciplined mind, a, a sober mind. Uh, you know what a sober mind is? Uh, literally, it's the opposite of a, uh, a drunken mind. <laughs> uh, not uh, checked out and od- idled and thinking fuzzy, because, but clear, focused, be alert, be ready, think. Uh, it's, it's not a time uh, to freak out. You do notice, by the, by the way, uh, even uh, in that verse that I read from Paul, that the dominant note in the New Testament, the dominant note in the New Testament and in the Scriptures uh, all across the Bible, all of the Scriptures, is uh, whenever it's talking about the end, uh, the, pr- the end of all things, the end of all things, the predominant note is one of hope, not fear. Did you hear what Peter said? The not the end is almost here the night is falling no he said the night is ending we are not to be afraid we are instead to be alert don't panic Uh, but therefore be alert and of sound mind sober mind so that you may pray what do you do with all the anxiety all the fear all the craziness around us at any time, pray. Uh, It is, of the list I said, the end almost, hopefully, of the election season. Did you hear that? Have you heard about that? People are talking about it a little bit. Uh, I am not, as I had a seminary professor who would say, I'm not a prophet, I'm not the son of the prophet, and I work for a nonprofit organization, which I could also say. Uh, I I have no inside track on anything. 
But it's, it's entirely possible that the next week is going to have a bunch of strange and stressful days for our country. Uh, wh- what, do we, what do we do with that? Well, look, Christians, Peter said, are those who look at the end of all things, the end of all things, and they don't panic, they keep a sound mind, and they pray. So, here's a question, church. How are we going to keep our heads clear so we don't panic, but we pray? Uh, it may be that we need to take some good some steps to uh, control even what's in our heads and what we're following. Probably a good rule in general is uh, to not be consuming so much news and social media of different kinds that it is way out of proportion how much of that we're, compo- we're uh, consuming as opposed to consuming the Word of God and spending time in prayer. Uh, because uh, the end is near. Now what? Don't panic. Pray. Now, the thing is, if it's the end of all things, and the first thing is don't panic and pray, well, then maybe we think, okay, if we've got that figured out, then maybe as the church we would think, well, then uh, our need is to settle in and hunker down. Okay, don't panic, so pray, got it, so now I just need to settle in and hunker down. You know, like when there's a big snowstorm coming, and you've got the wood in, and you've got the fridge stocked, and since uh, COVID now you've got tons of toilet paper stocked away, so you're all set for whatever things might come. Uh, And so you might think, okay, you settle in, hunker down, ride it out. The end is near. Don't panic. Pray. So now we just hide out, ride it out until Jesus comes back. Is that then what we're supposed to do? No, because we only have started with the first of these points that Peter gives to us. The end is near, but, and this is, now you're going to have to think with me even though it's Saturday night here. The end is near, but, and this is the key fact, it hasn't happened yet. So, don't panic, pray, and uh, don't hide. Steward, put your goods and your gifts to work while you still can. What a waste it would be to withdraw from this world, God's good world, before the end come. When he has given us life and time, and gifts to use. Uh, Don't panic, pray, don't hide, steward. And this is where we see the picture of the church here. We as the church are stewards serving Christ. You see that, don't you, uh, down uh, in verse 10. Each of you should use, after saying we should love one another, themes we've covered Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Then he says, each of you should use whatever gift you've received to serve others as faithful stewards. Faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. Uh, now, this is actually a description of a, of a job. You know, the, there was a position, especially in the ancient world, though we don't use that word anymore. Uh, but there are similar things in the modern world. A steward... Uh, was a particular position, a particular job somebody would have. Uh, The steward, you may remember this from the parables of Jesus, was a person in the household who was charged with managing the uh, master's business and property. In fact, when we lived down on the north shore of Boston, we lived in in an area where we knew a lot of people on these coastal towns on the north shore of Boston uh, where people would have these big estates and they would hire an estate manager. Uh, Often they hired uh, students (laughs) to come and live on the property, and in exchange for rent, uh, you would, or sometimes in exchange, sometimes on the bigger estates, you'd actually get paid for it, uh, you would manage the master's stuff. In fact, when Kelly and I first got married, that was my job. I was a steward at 115 School Street. Uh, I made sure that the silver was polished, true story. I made sure that the leaves were raked. I made sure that the pool was open. It wasn't my stuff. I took care of it. Now, a steward, a steward, that, that was, uh, was kind of like being the pool boy, but others have uh, even greater responsibilities of running the business and managing. We knew people who managed stocks and 
and made sure uh, different things were happening. So this is what a steward is. A steward, you get the picture, doesn't own what they have. They manage what belongs to another. And Jesus says uh, in several of his parables, and Peter says clearly here, that if that church, this is who we are. We are stewards. Don't panic, pray, don't hide, steward. Put your goods, goods and gifts to work. And you, we, they do have to be put to work. You know, Jesus told stories about stewards, as I've mentioned, uh, and there are actually a couple of them that you may remember. There's a couple of ways that stewards can really mess up their job working for the master. Uh, one way, like the parable that Jesus told in Luke 12, is that a steward can act like uh, the master is never going to check up on what they're doing. The steward in, in Luke 12 uh, becomes a petty tyrant and starts spending uh, the owner's money and starts you know, acting like a jerk to the rest of the staff. That's one way. But the other way that a steward can mess things up is by wasting uh, time and wasting their gifts that the master has given them until the master returns. That's the parable that's told in Matthew 25. Do you remember that one where different stewards are given uh, talents and one of them, the one who really does the worst, takes the, the talents and instead of putting them to work, buries them. And this is the kind of thing that Peter is speaking of here. Don't, don't hide. Steward. Uh, we should use our goods and our gifts for the will of God. Don't be like uh, this headline. Have you, maybe you saw this headline from a while back. Uh, man 91 dies waiting for the will of God. Did you see that? Man 91 dies waiting for the will of God. Tupelo, Mississippi. Walter Houston, described by family members as a devoted Christian, died Monday after waiting 70 years for God to give him clear direction about what to do with his life. He hung around the house and prayed a lot, but just never got that confirmation, his wife Ruby says. Sometimes he thought he heard God's voice, but then he wouldn't be sure and he'd start the process all over again. Did you see that story? That's a satirical website news story. Walter Houston isn't a real guy, but the phenomenon does happen. Sometimes we confuse and mysticize what it means to do the will of God. And Jesus says, uh, we are all given gifts and we need to put them to work. So what do we, can we say about these gifts that we've been given? Probably the first thing we can say is that they're gifts of grace. Look at verse 10. Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others. Received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. The, the steward is one who has been given grace by God. You know what the first gift of grace is to everyone who is in Christ. It's what Peter says in the first chapter of this letter. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Your life and your spiritual life is a gift of God's abundant grace. Uh, you have nothing left to do to make God love you or make him love you more. In fact, today, do you know, is Reformation Day. Uh, back in, what was it, 1519, uh, Martin Luther hammered 95 theses to the wall. And one of the things that, 1517, thank you, Ellie, 1517, uh, one of the things that Martin Luther said is, uh, God does not need your good works, but your neighbor does. The first great gift is to know when you trust in Jesus that you are saved completely, wonderfully. And then God, in his lavish grace, has not just made you his own. He's also given you gifts that you can use to serve your neighbor. Uh, and so, how do we know what those gifts are? Sometimes, again, we, we may complicate it to talk about what the, the will of God is for me. And, but I, let me... Show a slide. I think Addison has a slide. This is just a very simple way of thinking about how we know what our gifts are, so we can put them to work. I think you can see a slide above me. Can you? Yeah. This is, I, I'm sure I stole this from somebody, so, but I couldn't figure out, even with the help of Google, who. So here are three parts of just basic parts of figuring out maybe what discerning what your calling might be. 
rather than just waiting for God to write it in the sky, though he may. Uh, we, we, how do we know what these gifts are that we can steward? Uh, one part of it is just desire and ability. You know, uh, Peter says these are gifts of grace. In other words, you didn't work for them. You didn't go out and get them. You didn't take a list and say, I would like this gift and this gift. God gave them to you. He put them in you. Uh, and they are things you don't work for. They're part of how he made you to be and how he empowers you with the Holy Spirit. These gifts, you know what they are. You're just good at organizing. You look over and you just you want to organize things. You just want to set them right. You're good at cooking and welcoming people. You have a gift for teaching. You have a gift for, for sharing your faith. You have, a, you have a gift for woodworking. You have a gift for... You have a gift for mercy and justice. You care about things. You want them to be made right. Uh, you, you have some kind of a sense when you look at the world of the way things should be and a desire and even an ability uh, to do these things. It's part of how God has made you. Sometimes even just it starts with just the realization of a desire. I remember the first time I heard uh, a, a traveling evangelist preach he preached different. I actually was able to find him on YouTube this week. And I remember watching him as a kid who had no thought in my mind at all about ever doing what I'm doing right now. But I watched him do it and I thought, wow, I want to do that. And something in us responds, doesn't it? Some desire, some ability. But that's just part of it. This, the second part of it is need and opportunity. Because Peter says... The gifts that we have are not just for using for ourselves. They are, each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others. In other words, there's a need you can meet. There are things that need to be organized. There, there are people who need to be advocated for. Uh, Frederick Beekner said, Calling is where your deep gladness and the world's deep hunger meet. Your deep glad, the thing you love to do and the need in the world meet. Uh, meaning there's a need in the church, there's a need in the world, and you look at it and you say, I can't fix it, I can't do everything, but I can do something. Something in you responds to it. And not just that, the third part is community confirmation. Because it is serving others, so sometimes we're not self-aware enough to know uh, that we think we're really good at something uh, and we really think we're helping and Sometimes we need help from other people to say, I think your gifts actually lie over here. Or to have people say, you're right, God has gifted you in this. When these things come together, we know what our gifts are, and then we are to take them and to put them to work. Whatever is going on in the world, don't panic, pray, and don't hide, steward. Don't wait for COVID to end to serve Jesus Christ. Don't hide your talents. Put them to work. Find a way. Be creative. Seek help from others. There are many different ways that we could serve, and maybe there are some, because we record Saturday night, who are just at home and feel like there's nothing they can do, and let me just remind you of even this wonderful, wonderful, encouraging reality, that Jesus Christ said the most meaningful thing you can do above anything else is to love God and love your neighbor. Every day we're alive, we wake up with the opportunity to love God and to love other people. If you can do that, you are doing the most precious, important work in the world, says Jesus. Go to work. Steward. And for those who are serving, uh, for those who are serving, or all of us who are serving in these different ways, who are putting our gifts to work, what an, a tremendous encouragement to know that even in these weird times and even as frustrating as they are, Christ has given us these gifts and he loves it, when we, loves it when we put them to work. There was a um, chaplain for the U.S. Senate from 1981 to 1994 named Richard Halverson. And he's become famous for the benediction he would often give uh, at the end of his services. So it's actually uh, become known as the Halverson Benediction. It's wonderful. This is what he would say, sending people out. He would say, 
every time he would end a service, apparently. Friends, remember that you are a follower of Christ and you go nowhere by accident. Where you go, God is sending you. Where you are, God has put you there. The very Christ who fills you has something he wants to do through you wherever you are. Believe this and go in God's love, grace, and power. Don't panic, pray. Don't hide, steward. And yes, that may be difficult. It's a marathon. But Peter has one more encouragement. Uh, don't, don't panic, pray. Don't hide, steward. And here's the last one. Again, these are my words, not Peter's. But I think I'm faithfully representing Peter's words. Don't be a loner. Be a church family in Christ. Don't do this alone. If you are in Christ, you're part of the church family. We are stewards of grace. And in fact, if you have your Bibles, you can turn over to 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 8 and 9. They are very, very similar to the text uh, that we have tonight, 4 verses 7 through 11. Peter kind of re- repeats uh, some of these same themes. Listen to what he says in 1 Peter 5, 8 and 9. Be alert and of sober mind. Do you hear that same theme? Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith because, listen, because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of suffering. Stand firm because you know You are not in this alone. You're part of a family all over the world. Christians all over the world who are right now trying to figure out how to navigate all of these things. Brothers and sisters all over the world who are suffering even much worse than we are now. We stand together. Reminding ourselves, reminding one another that we are not in this alone and reminding each one another that we have this hope. Well, look at verse 11. If anyone speaks, they should do so as one who speaks the very words of God. Look at this. If anyone serves, they should do so with the strength God provides, so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and power forever and ever. Now, I have a problem with the, with the translation here. Just a small one. The ESV gets this right. To him, it should be, I believe, not to him be the power and the glory, but to him belong the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Peter is saying, don't be a loner. You need to go through this together in the church, but most importantly, even more important than that, in Christ. Not in your strength, in his. And do you remember who he is? All glory All power belongs to this Christ, your Christ. The one who fills you, who has claimed you, who has gifted you. He will supply you. When I was a high school student, an early college student, I used to work on my uncle's farm. And every summer, uh, I would drive up three or four days a week and I would work on Uncle Tom's farm. And about once a summer when I got older, they would leave me, uh, they would go camping or something, and I would be in charge of the, of the farm alone for three or four days, and I would have jobs to do. One, one summer, my job was to load up all the hay that had been baled in this small field of my uncle's. So I had to drive his, I got to drive his cool old GMC truck, uh, and I would park it and throw bales of hay in until the back of the truck was filled, and then I would drive over and unload them at the barn. Uh, And the thing with driving that cool old GMC truck was that sometimes when I would jump out of it, it it might have been uh, something to do with the driver, but sometimes I would jump out and maybe not get it fully into gear and it would start to roll a little bit and then I'd have to run and jump in. Maybe that happened on a couple of occasions, may have had something to do with the fact that I was like 17. 
Uh, one time it did that, and he was actually working on some, uh, he had some construction materials there. They were building their house, and I thought I caught it in time. I went home at the end of the week. When I came back the next week, I got there, and my cousins came running out and said, somebody dented our truck. And my heart sank. I thought, I don't know, it was me. I didn't realize it, but that had to be me. So I worked on it all week. Uh, I worked for Uncle Tom all week, just sitting there thinking, what am I going to do? And at the end of the week, I would always go in, and uh, my uncle would pay out, pull out cash. He always paid me in cash, and he would pay me, and then I would go home for the weekend. And I went in, and I didn't know what else I could. He'd work, he was a good uncle to me, and I came in, and I said to him, Uncle Tom, you shouldn't pay me this week. I dented the truck. And I forget what my, my uncle said. He said, when I hire someone to work for me and to use my tools, if my tools get broken in the process, that's my expense, not yours. He said, like in this, in this effect, he said this, I gave you the job. I gave you the tools. I want the job done. I'll pay every cost to get it done. Now Peter says, God, in his grace, through his son, Jesus Christ, has saved you. He has claimed you. He has called you. He has gifted you. And he is so committed to you and to the work he wants to do through you that he will not only call you to go to work, he will provide the strength that you need to do the work. You are a follower of Christ. And wherever you are, God is sending you, God has put you there. The Christ who has all glory and power fills you and he is able to give you what you need to do it. So now we come to communion. The end is near. Don't panic, pray. Don't hide, steward. Don't go it alone. Come to this table and eat this bread and drink this cup and receive the Lord's grace as we proclaim his death until he comes. Come soon, Lord Jesus.